are in listen-only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. This is Lauren Wenzel of the National Marine Protected Areas Center, and we're happy to welcome you to one of our MPA webinars. Um, today we're going to be hearing from Dr. Valerie Grusing on a cultural resources toolkit for marine protected area managers. Uh, before I introduce Val, I want to thank uh, EBM Tools and Open Channels, our partners on this webinar series. Um, and also, just to let you know how this is going to run, many of you have been on these before, but typically uh, we'll have the presentation, and uh, that will be about a half hour, a little bit more, maybe 40 minutes, and then we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So we really ask you to go ahead and use the question interface on the webinar uh, template on the, on the side of your screen. You can just go ahead and type your questions in there, and we will go ahead and uh, respond to those questions at the end. So if you have questions as you go along, please feel free to ask those. And I know some people are in a conference room here at NOAA with Val, and we'll also call on you all if you have questions. Um, so look forward to those. And so now I would like to introduce Val, who is the Cultural Resources Coordinator at the National Marine Protected Areas Center, and has been here for several years and is leading uh, all things cultural here at the center, having to do with work with uh, tribal cultural resources and also cultural, cultural resource management. And she is a graduate of um, or her doctoral degree from Eastern Carolina University. So Val, take it away. Thank you. Val, is it possible you're internally muted? Um, on your end, because we're not hearing you. And Val, um, Okay, I see you switched over the voice over IP. Um, yeah, the phone was working just fine until a second ago. Um, if you're using the voice over IP, um, you can just start speaking into your computer. Is it possible there's a mute on on your end? And if that doesn't work, maybe you could switch over to Joanne's computer. Okay, sorry everyone, so we'll hopefully we'll get uh, Val going. We had her sound up and running uh, up till a few minutes ago. Okay. Yeah, I think we can hear we can hear you guys now. Yeah, we'll touch that. Hi Val, we can hear you now. Okay. Hey Lauren, are you close by? Can you run? Hey, Val? So it's the back to telephone, not the back, I guess. Yeah, it's the back to telephone. Oh, that's what. All right, now we're no, no longer able to hear you. All right, I can see she's, she's calling in again, so hopefully we'll be all sorted out in just a second, everyone. Everything was still green. Okay, we can hear you now, Val. Can you hear okay. me? Yes. Okay, all right. Yes. Great, let's go. Thanks. 
Sorry, everyone. So first I'm going to give you a brief overview of the MPA Center, our mission and role, and then I'll tell you about the National MPA System briefly, its objectives and benefits. And then I'll segue to the cultural heritage work we've done since I came on board in 2009 and the progress we've made, which has led to the toolkit that I will then explain and demo. So the challenge that we're facing is that the majority of US MPAs were established to protect biodiversity and ecosystem resources. And managers and staff often lack expertise in cultural resources management. So we're aiming to reduce uncertainties in recognizing cultural heritage resources, which would then lead to the improved identification, documentation, preservation, and ultimately protection of the cultural heritage resources in both existing and potential MPAs, as well as incorporation of multiple voices and perspectives into MPA planning and management. Here's a bit of background on the MPA Center. It was established by executive order in 2000 to help protect and conserve the nation's natural heritage, cultural heritage, and sustainable production or fisheries resources. By developing a national system of MPAs, existing MPAs can build partnerships and networks to better accomplish these common goals, and areas can be identified where new MPAs would be beneficial. The MPA Center serves as the nation's hub for building innovative partnerships and tools to protect special ocean places. And last year, we merged with the Sanctuaries Office within NOAA. The conservation objectives for cultural resources include both material, cultural, and historic resources, such as shipwrecks, as well as sites important to the cultural practices of tribal and indigenous peoples. Existing MPAs include federal programs and sites, such as National Marine Sanctuaries, National Wildlife Refuges, and National Parks with a marine component. They also include federal and state partnerships, such as estuarine research reserves and the monument, as well as state and territorial programs and sites, such as state marine or ship, shipwreck reserves, state parks with a marine component, and any um, tribal or indigenous MPAs that may exist. Managers of these existing MPAs can voluntarily nominate them to join the national system if they meet the eligibility criteria outlined in our framework. Joining the national system does not alter an MPA's management authority. The eligibility criteria are these. Um, beyond meeting the definitions to be an MPA, such as being in the marine environment, having legal protection, and having a defined boundary, they must have a management plan, contribute to meeting a defined conservation objective, which is in our framework, and meeting additional criteria for cultural heritage MPAs. <coughs> We're in the process of revising our framework based on the recommendations of our Federal Advisory Committee, as well as our interagency MPA working group. And significant changes have been made to the cultural heritage components to be more inclusive of diverse resource types, as well as cultural perspectives and voices. The national system has the potential to provide numerous benefits above and beyond those benefits realized by individual MPA sites and programs. These benefits stem from the added value of the national system in linking and strengthening MPAs and MPA programs, including fostering regional MPA networks and professional networks of MPA managers and staff. This networking and capacity building will lead to more effective and efficient management of marine resources, including the social and economic values they provide. The benefits associated with the national system are linked to the level of investment in it and should increase over time. The cultural heritage changes to the framework came from the Cultural Heritage Resources Working Group. In 2009, when I came on board, the group was formed under our Federal Advisory Committee to provide technical expertise and recommendations on submerged cultural heritage resources for the development of the national system. Composed of federal, tribal, state, academic, and NGO cultural resource specialists, the group's strength is its national focus, spanning regions as well as jurisdictions. In 2011, the group produced and the FAC approved, which is our advisory committee, the white paper you may have heard of um, with the link here. And if you haven't seen that before, we can send that out um, with materials after uh, the webinar today. It can be found on our website as well. It recommended a cultural landscape approach 
to management, among other ways to strengthen the national system and improve resource protection. The paper expanded our understanding of cultural heritage resources to include the broad array of stories, knowledge, people, places, structures, and objects that together with their associated environment help to sustain cultural identity. It recommended a cultural landscape approach which integrates the management of cultural and natural resources at the ecosystem and the landscape level. This approach is analogous and complementary to ecosystem-based management, and we use this phrasing so the fish people at NOAA can relate which is not that many of us cultural resource folks. Fundamentally, cultural landscape approach examines the relationships among living and non-living resources and their environment over time. This also aligns with Sanctuary's Maritime Cultural Landscape Initiative, which is fundamentally based on the knowledge of place, the idea that people both shape and are shaped by the places that they value. Engaging communities with deep knowledge of a place, including its past, can inform planning and future management and lead to innovative solutions for problem solving on the coast. The white paper ultimately led to this toolkit, which is intended to operationalize the key recommendations from the paper and provide guidance for implementing them. We obtained a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to produce a virtual toolkit consisting of a modular approach to cultural resources management training and information with a focus on MPAs. As I mentioned, the majority of US MPAs were established to protect things other than cultural resources, and managers and staff often lack training and expertise in this area. This toolkit will provide information to assist MPA managers and staff in identifying, documenting, preserving and protecting the cultural heritage resources in their MPA, as well as incorporate multiple voices into MPA planning and management. We held an in-person workshop in February of this year for initial planning, and the group agreed that there are nine critical topics, which you see listed here. These, of course, are our cultural landscape approach, integrating cultural resources into MPA management, which includes assessment as well as management planning, community and stakeholder engagement, as well as outreach and interpretation, tribal and indigenous communities, research and data collection, including monitoring and evaluation, intellectual property and sensitive information, climate change adaptation, disaster preparation, and finally risk assessment and underwater archaeology training. There will also be a glossary, a compilation of legal authorities, and a section consolidating available tools and training. Here are the group members who have been creating content for the toolkit. They're mostly cultural resource experts, but we also continue to seek participation of non-experts, being our target audience, of course. One manager I invited to participate responded that he wouldn't be much help since he didn't have cultural resources in his MPA. If you're out there listening, I'm sorry to call you out, but you perfectly illustrated the need for this product. <laughs> There are always cultural resources in an MPA, is the punchline. We obviously need input from both specialists and non-specialists to make this as useful as possible, so please contact me if you're interested in contributing to this effort. My information is at the end of this presentation. I'm going to demonstrate a beta version of the toolkit, which is um, a work in progress. For each of the nine topics, the main topic page will include the what, why, and how, as well as some case studies, links to additional resources, photos and multimedia resources, and downloadable products that the, the team will create. The final formatting will likely change to be um, slicker than it currently is in its beta version and more user friendly so that we have tiered layers of information so users can efficiently get the level of info that they're looking for. Again, your input and contributions are welcome and please send pressing comments or suggestions to me by next Friday, October 17th. That is because um, the working group will complete the toolkit by next month, which will be fully operational on the MPA Center's website, and we're planning to launch it at the IUCN World Parks Congress in Sydney, a global forum on protected areas held every 10 years. 
I won't be there personally, but it's in good hands with members of the working group and staff from the MPA Center and Sanctuary's Maritime Heritage Program. We will also distribute the link to National System Partners, Program Managers, and other MPA Center contacts, and we can track uh, website visitation. Finally, we'll send out a follow-up survey to evaluate whether managers use the toolkit and how effective they found it. And moving forward, we'll continue to incorporate feedback to expand and strengthen it in the future. So here is the toolkit in its beta version. It's going to be housed on the MPA Center's website, marineprotectedareas.noaa.gov. The rotating images will also link to a picture gallery and um, ultimately a primer that we will create um, to help folks identify culture resources. Here are the nine topics in the order, cultural landscape approach. Um, all the way to risk assessment and underwater archaeology. Here's our big value statement here. There's many values and many voices um, associated with cultural heritage and MPAs. And we want to emphasize that um, there's a lot that can be learned from cultural heritage um, and benefits to MPAs and resources, as well as um, obligations to protect cultural resources. So there's many facets in that way. A lot of tools and training consolidated here. Legal authorities, um, we're not reinventing the wheel. This will be sort of um, a repository of those, as well as a glossary of other terms. We have two modules currently active. And as I mentioned, the formatting in the end will be slightly different. So that when we have, when users go to this um, introductory page for each topic, it's not going to be quite as text heavy as it is. There'll be pictures. There'll be the what, <clears throat> what you're looking at, which is this first paragraph here. And then we're going to tinker so that um, things like this will be a drop down. So this, this topic here, integrating cultural resources into MPA management, is really sort of the keystone. And here's the how, how to do this. So we've come up with a seven step process for integrating cultural resources management into um, MPA, Cultural Resources into MPA Management. That's based on a cultural landscape approach. So you develop the context of, a cult of cultural landscapes in the MPA, and then you assess the cultural resources that are likely to be there. Uh, you identify stakeholders and constituents with important connections to your MPA. This includes local tribes and indigenous peoples, but that's a separate step um, for several reasons. They're unique sovereign communities and need to be engaged separately from um, other stakeholders and constituents. Identify the primary statutory responsibilities for cultural resources management in your MPA. The legal authorities section can help with that. Then you identify available in-house and collaborative capacity for management and recognition that may already exist. And then finally, incorporating management and preservation into the management plan. So there will be links to most of these steps to other topics in the toolkit. So it's kind of circular in that way. We'll have case studies for each of the topics that will be the next level of information from each page. Here's a link to our white paper. And then the other module that we currently have <coughs> live is risk evaluation and underwater archaeology training. So again, the first paragraph is the what uh, we're dealing with. And when we create the primer and picture gallery, we'll have a, a link to that here. Meeting cultural heritage obligations is the why section. And then here is the how section for this. And we've got a case study here that you can read. Again, this will fundamentally, um, this will ultimately end up on and the next level of information. And for most of these topics, too, we'll have lists of additional resources and photos and multimedia resources, as well as some downloadable products, such as PowerPoint modules or PDFs that 
people in the working group currently um, have and use for any trainings that they may conduct. So the rest of the nine modules will follow this um, format as well. And we will continue to add content um, members of the working group as we, as we finalize this. And moving forward into the future, again, we are hoping to make this as useful as possible. So it's going to be um, a living, dynamic product that can be modified um, going forward into the future based on how effective we managers find it to be. <clears throat> I think that's it. And there is my contact information. And that concludes my presentation. Do you have any questions or comments? OK, thank you, Val. So I really would like to invite everybody to go ahead and put any questions that you have up here in the, in the question boxes. Um, you can go ahead and type those in, and we'll get back to you. And Val, there's one question that's come in from Casey Jacobs, who says, I see that tribal and indigenous communities are a focus of the toolkit. Are US island territories included? Uh, theoretically, some of the things that that section will include um, are also legal authorities and responsibilities. And it will link to the intellectual property and sensitive information topic. Um, any MPAs that are within uh, U.S. jurisdiction that this is intended to apply to. So, did you have okay. something specific in mind? Uh, no, I think that was a general question. And there's another that asks, uh, is there an expectation that each module would be utilized at every MPA? I think, ideally, that is the goal. Um, as I mentioned, with the tiered approach, we will have um, a minimum of necessary information on each topic main page um, so that managers can quickly get an overview and then delve deeper based on, their, based on their current needs. So if they need to start with uh, legal authorities, they can find out what their obligations are first. We, of course, are hoping that they will go beyond their obligations and to best practices as well as all of the other topics. Um, of course, that will depend on capacity, but ideally, all of these things apply in all MPAs, yes. Okay. And I would just encourage um, folks who are listening, if you have ideas of things that you would like to see, this is definitely going to be a living product. So we, this is a great opportunity for us to hear from you about things that you would like to see in this document. Um, so there's a question about, um, are you incorporating food security issues in this process from Kathy Kuhn? That has not specifically come up um, among the working group, but that's a great question that ties into several of these topics. So I will, I will bring that up. Thank you. OK. And then uh, there's a question about, is there a lead identified at the MPA Center to help managers implement these modules? I think you could, you could maybe think about that more broadly in terms of you know, what do we collectively plan to do about implementation, since this is really a, a group effort across several agencies and outside um, groups represented on the Cultural Resources Work Group. Right. So as Lauren mentioned, I'm the only cultural resources person at the MPA Center. but. Now that we are merged with the sanctuary's office, I think that there may be opportunities to um, to rely on that some some of that capacity as well. And I mentioned our um, advisory committee as well as our interagency working group. I think that um, um, in addition to the cultural resources working group that's drafting the content, we have a lot of um, contacts who have a vested interest in seeing this succeed. So. Um, within the MPA Center, we're currently pretty small, but like the national system, we rely on our, our partners to, to help make things happen. But I would just add to that uh, that you know one of the reasons we're doing this toolkit is that we really see the value, and we hope this will be the first step in 
some kinds of collaboration around how can we move forward on the things that are in the toolkit. So another question from Sherilyn Waddell is, um, are you anticipating that more MPAs will be established as maritime cultural landscapes based primarily on cultural resource values rather than natural resources? I think that's definitely a hope. Um, I will mention that um, the sanctuaries nomination process for National Marine Sanctuaries just opened up uh, earlier this year, and so that's intended to be a more bottom-up process for communities to nominate special places that they feel are, are worthy of being sanctuaries. In addition to that, um, entities with management authority are always open to, are always free to create their own MPAs, um, whether they be state, tribal, or other. And I think that um, an ongoing goal of the MPA Center since 2000 has been a gap analysis, and an exact process for doing that has not really been established. But um, I think that this has the potential to contribute to um, folks identifying resources in areas that are worthy of additional protection. Our boundary, our boundary expansion. Okay. okay. Are there uh, other questions from anyone else? So currently, uh, no questions on the log. Oh, here's one. Uh, from Joyce Steinmetz, who says, perhaps we should consider an outreach program for ocean stakeholders, such as bottom fishermen and sport divers. So I think here, uh, the thought is maybe to go beyond just the cultural resource managers or MPA managers who are the target of this product and think about other audiences. I think that's a really good idea. Thanks, Joyce. We'll add that to the list. So as you can tell, this is definitely a work in progress, but um, it is something that's going to be uh, up on the web in the next month and then uh, periodically updated after that as we can get more information. So we really do appreciate your input and hope that you will continue to um, provide input, particularly once it's up and running as you start to use it uh, or hear from others who are using it. So any other comments or questions? Okay, here's a, here's a comment from John Farchette who asks, how do we balance the protection of cultural resources and the identification and disclosure of sensitive cultural resource information? So we're going to have a whole topic devoted to that. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of issues that need to be considered. I'm, my, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm currently working on another major project that's funded by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management where that's one of our um, key outcomes is how do particularly tribes and indigenous communities um, protect their special places without having to reveal any um, potential sensitive information in the, in the face of federal undertakings that may come down the pipe. And um, the short answer is that sensitive information um, just shouldn't be revealed. So um, if it's a tribe we're talking about, then they just keep that information. And, find a way to talk about um, special places and resources in generic terms um, without revealing information that may be sensitive. And on the shipwreck side, um, there's laws that protect that information as well um, so that especially location information um, remains confidential while um, general areas receive protection. And that this guidance will be included in that topic, but if you have um, something to contribute on that front, then please do contact me. We'd love to incorporate it. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Oh, here's another. I learned about MPAs at the George Wright Society meeting. How has your interest in broadening the reach of MPAs to cultural resources been broadcast to the historic preservation communities such as SHPOs and other similar organizations? So I personally uh, attend a wide variety of conferences, including George Wright. I wonder if you have seen a, um, me give a presentation there. If so, thank you for um, thank you for attending. Beyond um, archaeology and anthropology conferences, um, we we try to conduct outreach. I keep my list of networks current, and um, we have several initiatives going on um, where we are in pretty constant contact with different communities. So um, 
there's a national conference of SHPO's meeting every year in D.C. that I try to attend. Um, there's actually not that many states with state underwater archaeologists within the purview of their SHPO, uh, and I'm pretty, I'm pretty close with all of those folks as well. So just maintaining contact in addition to um, conference presentations and staying current on the, the initiatives that they have going on as well. And a related question from Sherilyn also, why the emphasis on archaeology? Maybe you could say a few words, Val, about what cultural resources it, it encompass. Um, yeah, I guess I'm surprised to hear that comment. I think when my position was created um, before my time, the focus of cultural resources and marine protected areas probably was pretty um, shipwreck centric and uh, since I've been here especially we've tried to broaden that beyond um, submerged cultural resources to um, not just the cultural landscape approach, things that may be in the associated marine environment <clears throat> and not just archaeological but to live in communities as well um, and we certainly don't mean to convey or imply that um, living communities, indigenous or otherwise, um, only have important culture resources from the past. Um, culture is definitely living and dynamic, um, and heritage in particular is contemporary use of the past. So um, we, we're trying to take an inclusive approach. I'm curious um, if you may be able to, to tell me more by email um, what has given you that impression. That's, that's, we're trying to be inclusive. Okay. Well, um, doesn't look like we have any more questions, so I'll do one last call for questions. Oh, here's another one. How will the toolkit include tribal resources in the East where the original tribes are no longer there? That's an excellent question. Um, that's something we I've wondered as well in the, the bone project I mentioned where we're working with um, three West Coast tribes on developing a cultural landscape approach. It's definitely a different situation as far as uh, reservation boundaries and, and treaty reserved rights and <clears throat> communities that may still be closer to the place of their ancestral territory than they are on the East Coast. Um, I would note that just because there may not be consolidated tribal communities in a lot of East Coast and even Gulf regions doesn't mean that there are not um, descendant communities who still have a vested interest in those landscapes and resources. Um, they may not have as strong a voice, but I think uh, as managers it behooves us <clears throat> and falls on us um, responsibility-wise to to reach out to those communities and to um, to help raise their voice up and to help celebrate their um, their interest in those in those places and resources, it's definitely a challenge, um, but it's something that we're we're looking into in sanctuaries in several ways. Okay, those have been some great questions and some really good suggestions for areas that we might need to add to the toolkit. Um, or definitely consider for as it expands in the future. So um, any other final questions or comments? I was wondering if you could expand on the coupling of risk assessment and underwater archaeology in the toolkit in terms of where you're going with the phrase risk assessment in this context. The question from the room is about why are risk assessment and underwater archaeology associated in a module? Um, the quick answer is that um, we intend the term risk assessment in that context to mean associated with underwater archaeology training. Um, if there may be um, avocational groups that MPAs are employing to conduct work, which is happening in a lot of sanctuaries, then that's something that they need to consider as well. But um, I think there are other facets to risk assessment that could be considered separate from that topic. Does that mean like we were having a discussion with Joe Hoyt today? about our condition reports, <clears throat> and we're going to be looking at the ecosystem services uh, that sanctuaries. In the case of the monitor, 
it's, it's cultural resources, maritime heritage, and that kind of thing. But he was mentioned some of the pressures on the system come from researchers uh, recovering artifacts, oftentimes do damage um, while they're doing that, that ends up accelerating the rate of deterioration of the of the site. Is that what you mean here? Uh, that's one component of it. Mm -hmm. Damage is done to sites by, um, I guess, non-archaeologists or... Well, even archaeologists who are done, like when they recovered the turret off the monitor, um, they did damage that is going to appear the rest of it deteriorate a lot faster. So there's okay. A, you know, there's a trade-off when they go down to recover something, uh, what damage they might do in the process. Right. Archaeology fundamentally is destruction. <laughs> now there's a sound bite that could get taken out of context. <laughs> All right. I would like to thank uh, Val very much for sharing her uh, expertise with us. And I'd like to thank all of the participants for your excellent comments and feedback. And we will definitely be reaching out to all of you once this is up and running and let you know uh, about it and hopefully you can take a look and provide some additional feedback at that time. So thanks very much. <laughs>